bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. It's like never before, oh my soul, oh worship his holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, Lord oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, oh worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship his holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul I'll worship your the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, oh worship your holy name. Yes, I oh, worship your holy name. All right. Uh, with that, you may be seated for just a moment. And uh, we'll go through our welcome announcements and such. And so first off, thank you for coming. So good to be here. Glad you could come and join us today in fellowship and worship. And uh, for announcements, I know there is one in the bulletin saying that there is a missions committee meeting uh, after church. That has been canceled uh, for today. Um, due to some uh, funeral that Alan's got to go to, and then also Ann Seamster is uh, out sick as well. Um, and then also to make sure, uh, there have been some requests about copies of the sermon on DVD, um, and those are now available again. So basically starting uh, last week's sermon is in the uh, vestibule. If you'd like to get a copy of those uh, DVDs, you can pick one up on your way out. And are there any other announcements this morning? Apparently not. Okay. So let's, uh, do we have any praises this morning as we go into our time of uh, praise and prayer? Any good news this week? Got some rain. Amen. Cool down just a touch. Amen. Any other joys this week? Yeah, Donna. Bone marrow transplant? Okay, but Zeke had his second bone marrow transplant yesterday or uh, Friday. Um, so continue to pray for him. Any other uh, joys or prayer requests this morning? Yeah, Ellen?
Got it on? Good. Uh, so it's been about two weeks. I did a funeral up at Chatham, a real good friend of mine I grew up with, and I told you all about him, 62 years old. Got up that morning, he uh, loaded a load of calves, took them to Floyd, Virginia, sold them, came back. His wife came home from work that afternoon, and he was sitting in the recliner dead, 62 years old. Uh, his daughter-in-law was nine months pregnant. Darrell Easley. This was uh, Henry Easley. Got a son named Ben, and his wife is Sherelle, who's a good friend of Melody Brown. But uh, she was nine months pregnant, and we all thought, well, what a joy that baby's going to bring to a family who's grieving over a sudden death. Uh, this past week, she lost a baby. So that's a terrible tragedy. Uh, they named the baby Claire, and they buried the baby yesterday. Then I got a call Friday morning. My uncle Jimmy Giles fell dead suddenly. They all live right there together. This is in the community where I grew up. That's three people within a half a mile on the same road, all close friends and relatives of mine that have died in the past two weeks. So especially Ben and, and uh, Terrell's family, remember them in prayer. Uh, I can't imagine what they're going through, having lost a dad and now a baby all in just a short period of time. So remember the Easley family in prayer. And uh, my uncle's name was Jimmy Giles, and uh, remember the Giles family it was my mother's brother. There's seven children, and there's only one left, so remember the Giles family in prayer. I appreciate it. Ellen? All right, keep Missy in your prayers for possible multiple sclerosis diagnosis and treatment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so your friend Jennifer, who lost her husband this past week, Carson. All right, the Carson family. Any other prayer requests this morning? Yes, ma'am. So remember the Creasy family as they continue to grieve the loss in their, their family as well. All right. Any other prayer requests this morning? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just, Lord God, come before you and thank you so much for, for how you have uh, cared for us, Lord God, and how you've looked over us and watched over us, Lord God. And, and just as we, uh, we heard in Sunday school this morning, uh, are reaffirmed about your being in control in all things and in all times and all places and all circumstances, Father God, that when we face these many trials and, and tribulations in our lives, it's so easy to, to forget that you still have a plan in place, and Lord God, that it's never changing. Lord, we also just uh, lift up our concerns because we know that you, you ask to hear from us uh, what is weighing on our hearts, even though you already know them, you want us to to voice them aloud and that we can share and carry each other's burden here on earth as you do in heaven, Father God. So we, we lift up these many families, the, uh, the Easley family, Giles and the Creases, who've all faced loss here, Father God, in, in just the last week or two. 
Lord, that you would continue as they suffer through the grieving, uh, that you could give them some peace and comfort, that you would uplift them and uphold them and continue to bring Christian fellowship to them to help also provide some of that earthly comfort. Father, we also just continue to pray for Zeke and for Ann Seamster and many others who are, are suffering right now with uh, sickness and, and um, for Missy who are, are awaiting just diagnoses, Father God. We just pray that you continue to just um, give the doctors wisdom in their uh, evaluation and in their treatment, Father. We just also pray that uh, if appropriate, Lord God, that you provide healing, uh, Father, that the diagnoses may not be as, as dire as initially uh, thought, Father God, but also that despite the diagnosis, Lord God, that you would give us peace in, in dealing with those things, uh, Father, but also in comforting each other. Lord, we also just ask as we come at this time and lift you up on high and praise your name, Father, that you would just fill this place with your spirit, that you continue to just, Lord, uh, encourage us in our Christian walk and as we share our faith. Father, be in this place with us today as we worship you in, in music, uh, in the songs that we sing, Father God, but in the message that is presented and the message that we hear that it would truly impact our lives and delve deep into our hearts. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. If you'll stand together with me as we sing hymn number 217. sounds as music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me what my father has in store. be seated and then I didn't mention it before but if you do have an offering the uh, collection basket is in the vestibule good morning how's everybody this morning good I'm glad you're good Bob I'm glad everybody else is just mediocre Everybody's mediocre middle of the road well, it's good to have you here. Children's church. We're going to have children's church today. Praise God. <laughs> this morning scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 1. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Let's pray. Father God, it is good to be here this morning with our church family. And on this Sabbath day, we've come out to 
worship and praise you. And Lord, now comes the part of our service where we hear your word proclaimed. And Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for this lesson that you're going to teach us this morning through this word. And, and Lord, I'm just a spokesperson. I freely admit that I don't have any power or wisdom apart from you. But I pray, Lord, that you'd speak through me this morning, your solemn words of truth and wisdom. Speak them into our hearts, not just our minds. Let it go from our minds to our hearts. And let it go from our hearts into our hands and our feet and our legs. Let us, let us be moved to Christian action in this world. And Lord, if we do anything good, we'll be careful to give you the praise and all the glory. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. First. Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Now hear God's word. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different gift, kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and he gives to each one just as he determines. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though the parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we all were given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I've already said that I've got a funeral at 3 o'clock this afternoon. My uncle, I've been doing a lot of funerals here lately. Diane and Mike are here because I did uh, her mother's funeral a few weeks ago. Uh, it was a good one, wasn't it? It was a celebration of a Christian going home. That's what I'm going to do this afternoon. Celebrate my uncle's life in Christ and the witness. He lived it out. He lived it out. And, and that was in the Sunday school this morning, you know. The influence that Jesus Christ has on us, we're writing our own uh, eulogy right now. We're, we're living out our testimony. We're, we're living out what the preacher will say about us at our funeral. When I preach a funeral of a believer, it's a great, I kind of, I don't like the fact that it's a funeral because we're going to miss a person, but it's, it's good. It's, it's good to do a Christian funeral. And then when I get a funeral of somebody that I don't know for sure or their life didn't bear out the fact that they were a Christian, uh, the funeral of an un unbeliever, it's very difficult. 
very difficult. Puts me in a difficult position. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say. And it makes it even more difficult when the family comes up to me and tries to tell me, you know, I know they didn't go to church, but they were Christian. He was a Christian man, even though he didn't go to church and didn't have any of the signs. They, they're always trying to convince me that that person was a Christian. So I'll say that in the, in the funeral uh, message. That, Don't worry, brother. Brother Bill, he's in heaven now, you know, with the angels and, you know, and, and <laughs> I'm not going to do that if I don't know. I, I, and sometimes I don't know. Sally Sue's in heaven or Billy Bob is with the angels. I don't, I don't say that unless I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, I just preach the gospel when I'm not sure. I'll say uh, some nice things about the person if there are any nice things to say. <laughs> but I'm not going to lie at a funeral. I'm not going to lie at a funeral. Now, I'm not going to say somebody's in heaven. Puts me in a bad spot. I can't testify what... I don't know to what I don't know. Sometimes I really don't know for sure at all. But let me tell you something. If I do your funeral, well, this wouldn't be true of you because you're here today. But if I do a funeral for somebody that hadn't been in church in years, and it's not something physically wrong with them, that some people physically can't come to church. Uh, Some people can't come to church and they can go do other things, but they can't come to church. They're not physically able to do that. But uh, if you hadn't been to church in a long time and there's nothing wrong with you and I hadn't seen you in church in years, I'm certainly not going to say you're in heaven. I'm not going to say you're in hell. (laughs) I'm just going to leave it sort of neutral. Uh, I'll preach a gospel at your funeral, which I usually do anyway. If you are a Christian, listen to me here. If you are a Christian, you will be in church. If you're physically able to be in church, if you're a Christian, you're going to be in church. Because that one spirit's going to lead you to the one body. And the one body is the church of Jesus Christ. That spirit's going to lead you you there. If you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, you will be active in a church. You will be serving in a church if you are a Christian. If you are a Christian, you will be about your father's work in the church. Because this is where we do the Father's work. And this is the vehicle. A lot of people think that a church is to serve them. That's what it's here for. I hear hear from people when we don't serve them. I I hear, I talked a little bit last Sunday about blowback. I get some blowback from people. Oh, you hadn't hadn't come to see me in a month. Well, COVID virus, I hadn't been to see you in a month. Where have you been? You hadn't called me, you know, and, and, and... well, where have you been? I'm here every Sunday. <laughs> where have you been? But they want me to serve them. They want the church to serve them. But that's not what the church is all about. The church is the vehicle where we, through the church, serve Jesus Christ. And, and the mission of Christ in the world is leading. Jesus came simple, to seek and save the lost. That's the mission of the church, to go out in the world and seek and save the lost. And if we spend all our time ministering to the members and, and taking care of the members, then we miss something there. If you're not in church, you might be about your father's work in the world, but your father may not be the right one, amen? You might not be serving the right one. 1 Corinthians 12 is all about spiritual gifts and the church. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 through seven there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit there are different kinds of service but the same lord there are different kinds of working but the same god works all of them in all men now look at verse seven now to each one the manifestation of the spirit is given for what for you no it's not this this gift this spiritual manifestation is not given for you. This spirit's not given. It's given for the common good. It's given for the church. It's given for the kingdom of God here on earth. It's not about you. One spirit given for the common good. It's not for you alone. It's not for you in a bubble. It's not for you, the Lone Ranger Christian. There is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. There are no solitary Christians. Got that? There are no solitary Christians. 
There are no closet Christians. You ever known a closet drunk? I had a, I had a real good friend that was a closet drunk. I didn't know he drank. <laughs> I saw him walking up the road one day. We went to work at the food line. I saw him walking up the road, and he was miles from the warehouse, and I knew where he lived. He was miles from his house, and, and we were going down the road. There's about eight or ten food line truck drivers. They dispatched us all at the same time. And when he saw us coming, he ducked his head. Didn't look at us. We honking horn. Wait, what is John Thomas doing walking up the road in, in the morning like this? He lost his car the night before. And he woke up in a motel somewhere down in Newport News and didn't know where his car was at. The only way he found it is the police called him and said they had impounded it. He needed to come get it. He don't know how it got there or why it got there. But he was a closet drunk. I didn't even know he drank until then. And he didn't tell me until years later what, what that was all about. He wouldn't tell anybody what he was doing on that road. <coughs> didn't know. He was ashamed of the life he was living. That's why he lived it in the closet. Are we ashamed of the Christian life we're living? Are we ashamed? Are we so ashamed that we, we only do it in church? We, is this our closet here? Do we come to church on Sunday dress all up and, and act all Christian and bring our little Bible and listen to their preaching. And, and, and this is our closet. Once we get out of the closet, we don't, we don't even profess to be Christian. We don't even act like Christian. We don't witness to the world. We're not trying to lead other people to Christ. We're just closet Christians here in our little comfy church. You know comfortable is a terrible place for a Christian to be. A lot of people, I preach sometimes and pre people go out the door and say, boy, I preach, I, sure, I enjoyed that. Well, it wasn't for your enjoyment. I never preach for anybody's enjoyment. I'm trying to stir you up in case you hadn't noticed that. That's why I get loud sometimes. That's why I get up in your face sometimes. I'm trying to stir you up. I'm trying to stir you to Christian action. I'm trying to, through the preaching of the word of God, open you up with that double-edged sword. I'm trying to move you by the Spirit. The Spirit is in me, but the Spirit's also in you if you're born again Christian. But that Spirit's not to sit there dormant. It won't sit there dormant if it's in you because Jesus Christ is on the move. He was a traveling evangelist. I don't know of anywhere in the Bible that it says we're to stand still with Jesus. We're to walk with him. We're to act like him. We're to talk like him. We're to be like him. We're to have the mind of Christ because we've got the spirit of Christ. This is God's church. This is where we are moved to action. This is how we act through the church when we bring our gifts. Look at uh, verses 1 through 3 again. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, Somehow or other, this is sort of what we were talking about in Sunday school this morning. Somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who's speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit. Is Jesus your Lord? <laughs> when we were ignorant, when we were led astray, when we were pagans, we were chasing after idols and led astray. You know, I don't expect any different from the world. You look at the world. Connie, my wife, she's getting real upset with the political winds that are blowing out there and, 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 and watching the news. She's getting real upset with the news. But, <laughs> and I keep telling her, Jesus is still on the throne, and you can't expect any better out of them people. They're in the world. They're not following Christ. I don't expect anybody. When I turn the news on, I don't expect good things because I know who's reporting the news. I don't expect them to talk about good things. That's not what the world is concerned about, good things. God is good, and he's the only good. I expect the children of God to be following a good God. I expect the children of God in the church today to be doing good works of God to serve that God by that good Holy Spirit that lives in every one of us. I don't expect much from the world. Now, by the Spirit of God, we call him Lord. 
We call him Lord. Is he your Lord and Master? Then he has the right to lead you and guide you and tell you what to do and where to do and how to do it. And it's not burdensome once he's your Lord to do that. We want to do that because we want to please the Father. You can't say Jesus be cursed and you can only say Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit. You don't have the Holy Spirit living in you. You don't know Jesus is Lord. You might know him as a figure in a book. You might know him as a figure in history. But you'll only know him as Lord by the Spirit. By the Spirit. You've been born again. One of my favorite scriptures about being born again is in John chapter 3. Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. I just love it. So I'm going to read it to you. Chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who's come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and what? Water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You're, you hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? He didn't get it. He didn't get it. He, it hadn't yet happened to him. He didn't know about the spirit-filled life. He didn't know about being born again. Being born again. You've been born again. I've been born again. We've been spirit-filled. You are now not ignorant. You are now not a pagan. You are now not chasing after idols. You are now following Jesus Christ as Lord. Aren't you? Aren't we following Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? He takes you somewhere if you're following him because he's on the move. He takes you somewhere. He gives you a spiritual gift. It comes with the Holy Spirit. Everybody, everybody who's born again has a spiritual gift. It's a unique one. Now, I, I got the gift to preach and teach. And other people got that gift. But it's unique to us who got the gift. And the other gifts that, that are necessary to make up the body, I'm not the church. I can't be a church. I'm just one little part of the church. But all of us together with our spiritual gifts come together and we form the body of Christ, which is the church. For what? For the common good. For the common good, for the good of the church. And what's good for the church is good for the world, amen? When the church moves out into the world, it has a good influence on the world. And we might even perhaps lead some unbelievers into the church and into the kingdom of God to be born again the way that we are. For the good of the church, we're given these gifts. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. One spirit. Now look at verse 14. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, and it goes on, each part is unique. What, what would you be like? I mean, we have people who can't hear. We, we know people that can't see. And they are impaired. We call them impaired people. Well, the church, if all of its parts aren't functioning, is an impaired church. 
What is a person without a right hand or a right arm? They are impaired. They can still function some, but, but they are impaired. They can't function as well as if all parts were working together. Our body is built to work together, and so is the church and the spiritual gifts. They're all meant to work together for the common good, and, and we're not complete unless everybody's doing something, unless everybody is exercising that spiritual gift. And he puts us, look, look at this again. He puts us where he sees fit. But God, in fact, verse 18, but God, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Why, is, why does God have, we do nominate him, didn't we? We, do, we just did it. God arranges the parts where he sees fit. I hope, I hope and I pray when we were doing the nominating, that we were following the Holy Spirit. I do hope and pray that the people that we nominated for those positions have the gift to fulfill those positions. And the only way that we can know, and, and you know we have trouble filling the positions. We have trouble, we don't have 12 deacons. That impairs the church when we can't fill the positions. That impairs the church. And we aren't functioning at full strength. We're running with, with one leg. <laughs> We're operating with one arm. God puts us in the place that we should be because Father knows best. We're in God's army. We're in God's service. I went in the Air Force 1971, right out of high school. I graduated from high school in, in, in June of 71 and I went in the Air Force in, in January that same, well it was the next calendar year but it was within a year, 1971. <clears throat> they did some testing on us before they let you in. You had to pass a test to get into the Air Force. It wasn't like the Army, the Army take anybody, the Air Force a little more particular. You had to take a test to get in there. And then when we were in basic training, <coughs> They kept us up day and night and very little sleep. And we went in and we did days and days of testing, kind of like SAT tests. And we would test and test. What are they doing? I can't hardly barely stay awake. And they all these tests. What are, they, what are they doing with all these tests? And I didn't try very hard. I didn't want to do the test. I was tired. And I, I, wasn't, I didn't like school. I didn't like taking tests. And then they finally told us, well, we're doing all these testing to see what kind of job you get for the next four years. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh. <clears throat> you know what? I prayed to Uncle Sam. You know what I said to Uncle Sam in that prayer? Uncle Sam, please don't let me be a cook. I don't want to be a cook. <laughs> I'd seen what them cooks were doing. <laughs> they were sweating. They were up in that kitchen flipping them eggs and Cash brown, I, I don't want to be a cook. Man, I wish I'd have done better on that test. I wish I'd have tried a little hard on that test. I wish I'd have known what the test was all about. <laughs> I'd have done better. We were praying, don't make us a cook. Everybody was. Is that the way it is in God's army? We're taking a test to see what kind of position we'll get. In heaven. In heaven. You know, he that's been faithful over a little hill will be given much there. And it's not about much gold. It's not much, we're going to walk on gold. What will we do with gold? <laughs> it's not going to be about money because we we're not going to need for anything. It's not going to be about good looks because we're all going to be good looking because we're going to get a brand new body and we're not going to need pills and all that kind of stuff. He who's been faithful over a little hill will be given much responsibility there he who's taken that spiritual gift and worked it through and in the church and for the common good is going to be given much there we're we're in our test uh donna what's the name of the book preparing for what our final job review our final job review is going to be in heaven we're taking the test now to see what our position in heaven will be. 
but you need to know what your position now is in the church. What is your spiritual gift? If I pass you out a piece of paper, I said, okay, I want all of you to write down what your spiritual gift is and what you're doing with it for the church. Well, if I just pass out a piece of paper, you may not know what your spiritual gift is. What are you doing in the church? What are you doing for the church? If everybody, <clears throat> now, that COVID stuff gonna, is dangerous. But what if everybody didn't come to church? What if everybody didn't send any money? What if everybody, like an ostrich, went and stuck their head in the sand? We can't just quit. What if everybody, what if everybody did as much in this church as you do, what kind of church would it be? What if everybody spent the amount of time you spend serving this church, what kind of church would it be? Now, some of you can stand up here and say, boy, it would be all right. Because <laughs> I serve this church well. I spend a lot of time in it. How many of you can say that? You know, I never, I didn't get, I wasn't a cook. Uh, I was a material facility specialist. Hey, hey. I worked in a warehouse. You know what I did in the Air Force the first year I was in? I thought it was going to be flying planes. I rode a bicycle. That ain't no joke. You think that's funny. That's the truth. That warehouse was so big, it was about a mile long. And the quickest way to get from one end of it to the other was a bicycle. And I had a little basket on that bicycle, and this computer would kick out a piece of paper, and I'd read that piece of paper. They want such and such a part down to the delivery. So I'd ride that bicycle around the warehouse, and I'd pick it up. Had more fun than a barrel full of monkeys. That was fun. Ride that bicycle, I slide that thing around the corner, ran over a couple of people, but I didn't hurt them bad. <clears throat> but I wasn't no cook. But I didn't have a choice. I never wanted to be a preacher either. Never thought of myself as being a preacher. Don't God have a good sense of humor? But he knows what he's doing. I never thought I'd be a preacher. Never thought I'd be any good at it. I never thought I could do it. But God knows best. And you got something in you that only God can bring out. You got something in you that God can use. But you got to find out what it is. You got to plug into it. Our joy is in using that gift that God has given us in the church for the common good. Now this ain't rocket science, is it? Got to find that gift that God's given you to serve the church for the common good. Our primary gift, our spiritual gift, is unique to us. It's unique to us. Something we didn't have till the Holy Spirit gave it to us. My son works at Goodyear in Danville. He's an industrial mechanic. And he was talking to me one day about working out of class. I said, what are you talking about, working out of class? He said, that's union junk. He said, if I'm working on a piece of machinery, and he's a master welder, he was that before he went to it, and it needs a piece welded on it, I can't do it. I have to put in a work order to the welders, and then they might show up a day or two, which, which it, they need this part fixed, this machine fixed, but the union, because they can't work out of class, they had to wait for the welder to come. Then, then he said, Lord forbid you have to have an electrician because they, there's a sorry bunch over there. He said, you can't get the electrician to do anything, but you can't work out of class. He's a master welder. He could do it, but the union won't let him. And there's a reason for that. And I tell you a good reason. It, it was something that happened over there. A mechanic was working on a piece of machinery, a machine, and it had a kill switch on it. Now, there's a key that plugs into that, that switch. If you take the key out, nobody can turn that machine on. Well, this guy was working on a machine, and somebody had, short, had done away with that safety switch. And there was a guy up in there working on a machine, and somebody comes along, pushes the button, turns it on. Crunched him. Mashed him all up because somebody didn't know what they were doing and they were working out of class. There's a safety reason for that. There's a safety reason. You and I can do a lot, 
But when we work out of class, we don't do it so well. When we do somebody else's job, we might can do it, but we can't do it as well as they could do it because we aren't gifted in that. We need everybody in the church to be using the gift that God gave them because that's their specialty. That's their class. That's what they do the best. And I can't do it as well as they can do it. Works better when we all use our gifts, our spiritual gifts. <clears throat> now I want to tell you about a real killjoy. What was it? Can you put the title of the sermon back up there? Title of the sermon. Guaranteed killjoy. I bet you wonder what that's all about. Guaranteed killjoy. Now I'm going to tell you a little story. I got saved in 1991. You already knew that, didn't you? Know what day? Y'all too. December 29th, 1991. Connie and I started going to a little church, Methodist church down in Dinwiddie County. I rode around and I picked it out myself. That's it. When I rode around, I looked. That's the church. Little white frame church with a red tin roof. Big old oak trees growing up beside of it. It had been used for a hospital in the Civil War. That's how old it was. Beautiful. That's it. That's where we're going to church next Sunday. We started going to church there in January 1991. Long about April, the grass started growing. The grass got higher, the grass got higher, the grass got higher. So one day I asked them, nice people, country folk, I said, who mows the yard around here? One of them looked at me and said, whoever bothers the most, if that grass bothers you, I said, yeah. <laughs> Gets my shoes wet when I walk across the yard. Yeah, that stuff bothering me. I said, no, no joke. Who, who mows the grass? They said, well, if it gets high enough, Van Miller, he lives about a mile down the road. He'll ride his lawnmower up in and he'll mow it. Well, it must not be bothering Van Miller yet because it was about knee high. That's kind of like saying, well, that drip ain't bothering me because it's hitting you. That, that drip up there. If that drip starts hitting you, it's going to bother you. You're going to want to get the roof fixed. That's the way they were operating that church. There's something wrong with a church like that. Something wrong. So I told them, I said, well, where's the lawnmower? I'll mow the grass. They said, we don't have one. I said, well, appropriate the money to buy one, I'll mow the grass. They said, if we had a lawnmower, we wouldn't have a building to put it in. I said, appropriate the money to build a building, I'll build a building, you buy the lawnmower, and I'll mow the grass. How about that? I'm going to solve your problem. I'm going to mow the grass. So they appropriated the build money to build a building. You ever built a building by yourself, Robert? All right till you get to the roof. It's all right. I got to the rafter part. I, I built that building. I got to the rafter part. Now, how am I going to get that up there and nail that to that? How am I going to stick the two up there together, the rafters, and nail them in the middle? That was a dilemma. But I'm smarter than the average bear. So <clears throat> I nailed me a board right up in the middle. I stuck one end up, and I climbed up that ladder and pulled that up and nailed it right there in the middle. Then I went and got the other side, I pulled that up and hit that thing and then I nailed them together. And I did that with every single one of them. I went down through that, nailing every single one of them. Now that was hard. Guaranteed killjoy, working by yourself, doing a, a job by yourself that it takes a group of people to do. That's a guaranteed killjoy. Then I started mowing that grass. It got me a long while after I finally got the building built. I started mowing that grass. I'm riding around the yard, riding around the yard, getting madder every time. Every circle, I, every time I mowed that grass, I got madder. You know what I got mad about? Them people don't care. The rest of these folks in this church don't care about this grass. And that's a problem. I don't care how good a Christian you are. I don't care how good a Christian you think you are. You work alone in the church, you're going to get discouraged. You work alone in the church, it's a guaranteed killjoy because that ain't God's plan. You know the only way that you can have joy in your life, live out God's plan for your life. You know the only way that a church can be a joy-filled place is when everybody's working together and using the spiritual gifts that God has given us. I don't see too many joy-filled churches. I see a lot of struggling churches. I see a lot of churches that 
have potential, but they're not living up to it. <laughs> you know, before I was a Christian, even when I was in the Air Force, when I was a young man, I look back at my life as a young man. I shouldn't have been riding a bicycle. I should have been flying a jet, a F-4 jet. That's what I should have been doing instead of riding a bicycle. But I didn't live up to my potential. I don't want that to be the case in my Christian life. I don't want that to be the case in my adult life, that I'm not living up to my potential. And when I stand in front of God one day, I won't, I'm not going to be happy but with one thing. That's for Jesus Christ to look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. If he says anything to me other than that, I ain't going to be, I know I didn't live up to my potential. What's Jesus Christ going to say to us when we stand in front of him? You're living it out now. You might not can do anything about yesterday or last year. But you can do something about today and forevermore. I didn't say today until you die. I said you can do something about today and forevermore. If you start today. But I suggest you get started. What's your spiritual gift? What's your spiritual gift? How are you going to use it better here in this church? And I'll tell you a little secret. If this ain't the church for you, you better move. You better go somewhere where you can serve better. If this ain't the church for you. If this is where you think God put you, then this is a good place to serve him. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for loving us, blessing us, teaching us guiding us and showing us the way into the kingdom. We look forward to being there with you soon. But until then, bless us here. Use us. Use that gift that you've given us. Help us, Lord. Encourage us. Inspire us to get out there and get to work for you. And Lord, if we have any success, we'll be careful to give you the praise and all the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're going to do a hymn of invitation. If you want to make a rededication of your life, you want to say to me, you know, I really would like to start again. I'd like to do better. I'd like to start from today. Come up here and take my hand. Just say that, and we'll pray about it. You want to be born again? You think you haven't been born again? Good time to come up here and take my hand and say, look, preacher, I want to be born again. And we'll pray about that. You can ask Jesus Christ into your heart. You want to pray for somebody? Come up to the, to the side and pray for somebody. No lost person? I can't imagine you don't. Pray for them. Let's stand and sing. How deep the Father's love. Oh, shit.
will bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you. But I pray that he'd inspire you to, to, to better things in life, and that's serving him. Serve him the best that you can, and to him be the glory. Amen.